Uh, my name is Zainab. I am a member of the Mohivan Initiative. Um, and I'm really excited to invite you all to this event um, about fitness, nutrition, and fasting during Ramadan. Um, we're really lucky to have two seasoned experts with us this evening to educate us on any questions we might have um, as we manage our nutrition and wellness and fitness during this month. Um, so with us this evening, we have two really amazing speakers. Um, first, we have Sister Nosheen Hayat. She is a registered and licensed nutritionist and founder of Hayat Nutrition. Her organization focuses on helping women with hypothyroidism and polycystic ovary syndrome reduce symptoms and live healthier lives through the power of nutrition. She has clinical training at the NIH. Um, as well as a master's in public health nutrition from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. And then we also have a fitness expert with us this evening, um, and that is Rizal Mufarahi. He is the owner and co-founder of Neural Movement, which is a fitness company geared towards improving health and wellness by focusing on the nervous system and bridging the gap between cognitive and physical development. What started as a small business for Reza grew into an internationally renowned program that trains celebrities, professional athletes, children, adults, and individuals with special needs. Um, so we're very excited and lucky to have both of them here with us this evening. Um, before I pass it off to our speakers, I just want to remind everybody of the event format. Um, so we are going to have Sister Nasheen begin, followed by uh, Brother Reza's lecture. And then after both of them speak, everybody will have an opportunity to engage in a question and answer. Um, and so we ask that you save your questions for then. At that time, you can put your questions in the chat or use the raise hand function to speak directly to the speaker. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it off to Sister Nosheen. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Um, thanks for joining. I'm really excited to be here and share some of my thoughts on how to um, have a healthier Ramadan. Um, so I'm just gonna get right into it, um, starting with kind of, I like to talk a little bit about what the difference between Ramadan fasting and intermittent fasting is, because oftentimes when we think about Ramadan fasting, the first thing that comes to our mind is intermittent fasting. And there are a few distinctions between the two, so I wanted to share those. Um, so number one, <clears throat> Ramadan, so just a brief overview of intermittent fasting. Usually there's a lot of people doing intermittent fasting nowadays. It's a pretty popular diet. Um, and usually the way it works is you fast during a certain number of hours of the day, and then you have an eating window, so to speak. The most uh, common way of doing intermittent fasting is fasting for 16 hours um, and having an eating window of eight hours. So that typically looks like um, breaking fast at noon around lunchtime and then stopping um, any form of eating at 8 p.m. So from 8 p.m. to noon the next day, usually people are fasting. Um, so some of the differences between intermittent fasting and Ramadan fasting is that Ramadan fasting involves nocturnal eating. So essentially we're breaking our fast at when it's dark out and we're also eating our Saturday time when it's dark out. So our entire eating episodes are occurring during a time period when we're actually not really designed to eat. Um, and that's because uh, as human beings, you know, we are kind of, we have something called a sleep wake cycle. We kind of wake up with the sun and we can are supposed to sleep with the sun, but due to modernization of our lifestyles, um, we do end up staying up later than, than we normally would have before electricity, I guess. Um, so that's number one, it's nocturnal eating. We're consuming uh, most of our food during a time period when we're generally a little bit more insulin resistance, when our body is actively preventing the storage of nutrients um, in the food that we're eating. Uh, and when I say storage, I mean like in the liver and muscle tissues, um, because you know, at that, during that time, we're supposed to technically be sleeping and not eating. And so the body has mechanisms in place to prevent sort of low, low blood sugar. So it's, it doesn't really know, doesn't, isn't the, uh, the most, um, efficient and knowing what to do when we're eating during the, those hours. Um, the, the second thing that's different from intermittent fasting and Ramadan fasting is that we, um, deal with sleep deprivation with Ramadan. So we're often, you know, our fast, we're breaking our fast around 8 PM. Oh, it's going to get a little bit later as the month goes on. 
And then we are staying awake to do our ibadat and all of that. And then of course, it's also broken sleep because we're waking up for Sahih. So the sleep deprivation piece is also a really important distinction. Um, and we know that even as little as six days of sleep deprivation can alter how well we process sugars. Um, it can alter our mood. So in general, it's just not the most um, uh, supportive of our health. Um, and then the last p the last distinction is, goes back in hand in hand with the nocturnal eating. We essentially have um, an altered circadian rhythm. So, so what do I mean by circadian rhythm? That's that's uh, what I'm referring to is our sleep wake cycle. So again, you know we are awake more hours at night, um, and we're likely not making up that sleep during the day because we all have jobs and work to do and responsibilities. So that can also kind of be altered. Um, so when the reason why I'm making this distinction is because I think we often as Muslims, um, we have this, we tend to have, we sometimes fall into this um, habit of trying to kind of uh, bring science to support some of our Islamic beliefs. And I think it's important to recognize that sometimes um, that sometimes that evidence is just not there and it's really not necessary. I think as Muslims who are living in a Western society, uh, we feel that pressure, but at the end of the day, Ramadan is a spiritual prescription, not a physical one. So we should um, be mindful of not superimposing things that are just, you know, very distinct and just are not actually similar. Um, okay, so with all of that being said, you know, I, I pointed out that there are some like negative effects on the health when we are doing Ramadan fasting. Um, but with all of that being said, it's important to remember that Ramadan is short term and can be recovered from. So individuals who are generally in good health um, will be perfectly, you know, will re regulate at the end of the month and go back to kind of feeling um, normal. Um, this is very, this is uh, different for people who have hormonal imbalances. So I work with women who have PCOS, hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune condition. Um, and they generally have a lot more difficulty bouncing back from a month like Ramadan because fasting has an, um, Ramadan fasting specifically has an even greater implication on hormones. Um, so um, I won't touch on kind of navigating. Um, I don't know if I should, but I do sometimes touch on kind of navigating the decision to fast because I know that there's a lot of people in our community who have health problems or just in general have difficulties that might make it difficult to fast. And so, but I think I'll skip over that. Um, so I also wanted to touch on how Ramadan and intermittent fasting impact health. Uh, there's four ways that um, our health is kind of impacted with Ramadan or intermittent fasting. Number one is that we are consuming less calories in general. So of course we have limited opportunities to eat. We're only eating, really only eating two meals and we also have a very limited time window to eat. So it's natural that we are gonna, we're not gonna be able to consume the the same amount of calories we would consume if we were eating on a regular like three meal schedule. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that blood sugar regulation is very drastically impacted when we're fasting for long periods of time. So our body has a lot of mechanisms in place to regulate blood sugar, Mom, to regulate blood sugar when there are instances when we can't eat. So number one, we put away a lot of sugar in our liver and the liver will release that sugar when we go long periods without eating um, to balance our blood sugar. And then the next, once the liver is depleted of sugar, then our body taps into stress hormones. And we are very consistently tapping into stress hormones to balance our blood sugar when we're fasting because we are fasting for like about 14 hours. And previously, previous years we've fasted for much longer than that. Um, so blood sugar regulation, again, I am coming from a hormonal imbalance perspective. So that blood sugar regulation piece can be a little bit more difficult for people who have hormonal imbalances or people who have prediabetes or diabetes as well. Um, because we are also we also have less instances of eating episodes um, and just generally like a restricted feeding time, we also will naturally just get less nutrients because we're competing. And then I'll talk a little bit about how to prioritize certain foods 
to hit most of your nutrients when you're fasting. But if you're not being proactive about the choices that you're making, it's very likely that you're missing out on some important nutrients when you're fasting. And then I already touched on how sleep deprivation can impact blood sugar regulation and just mood and all around um, can negatively impact our health as well. Um, so I'll talk now a little bit about some tips to focus on during Ramadan to support your health. Um, so number one is waking up for Sahari, which I know is a struggle for some of us. Some of us would rather sleep than to eat. I would say if you're generally in good health and you don't have any specific conditions that you're dealing with, I think that you really could get away with not waking up for Sahari. But of course, we know it's sunnah to do that. So of course, if we can, we should. Um, but if you are dealing with some specific health conditions, um, you're really want to going to want to pr prioritize the sahari because, you know, it's one of two eating episodes, and that's how you're going to support your liver function, get in, uh, refill your glycogen stores, and just be able to get yourself through the day. Um, number two is hydrate smarter. So a lot of people seem to think that just drinking more water is hydration, but hydration is really actually electrolyte, electrolyte replenishment. So electrolytes are sodium, potassium, calcium. Um, and these are all really important electrolytes um, or minerals. And when we just drink water, we're actually not um, hydrating ourselves appropriately. When we are dehydrated, it's not just fluid that's kind of out of flux. Um, it's also electrolytes. So I'm going to touch on, um, I'm going to touch on a few recommendations on how to hydrate smarter. I just want to make sure I have that information. Um, actually I can talk about it now. Um, so number one, um, Opting for um, fruits and vegetables, which are about 75 to 95% water um, combined with the minerals. So fruits and vegetables are also really rich in potassium. Um, all foods have some level of sodium. Um, these foods are gonna be a really great way to hydrate as well as also get a good amount of nutrition into your diet. Um, so breaking your fast with, of course, it's another to break your fast with a date and water. And that combination is actually pretty cool because water naturally moves in the direction of minerals and sugar. And the date is, dates are very rich in minerals and sugar. So I think it's kind of cool that that combination is what's recommended for us to break our fast. So breaking your fast with a date and um, small amount of water and then um, hydrating with a fruit salad or something like that or breaking, you know, eating a fruit salad next would be a really good way to hydrate as well as kind of um, get in a more nutrient dense food options. Um, and then in terms of liquids, um, again, like I said, with water, you really don't want to like drink a, a large amount of water at once. You want to be sipping on it throughout the night. Although I know that sometimes when you're really thirsty, it can be difficult to kind of fight that urge to drink like a big glass of water. Um, but if you can manage it, sipping on your water is going to be a, a better um, way to hydrate and it's um, actually going to actually move that fluid into your cells as opposed to kind of just overwhelming your system and then pushing your system to kind of just get rid of it. Um, and then opting for um, liquids like um, coconut water can also be a great way to get the fluids as well as the electrolytes. Um, I don't know if this is as big of a deal for Iranian crowd, uh, minimizing fried foods. Um, I know they see love their pakore and samosa. So um, I don't know if that's, I don't think that's as big of an issue for an Iranian <laughs> uh, community. But if you can, I would recommend minimizing um, fried foods or just kind of like Generally, you know, we like to make a lot of treats for ourselves during the Ramadan because we're fasting all day. So I'll talk a little bit about how to prioritize food on your plate if you really want to get the most bang for your buck. Um, number four is prioritizing protein. Um, number five is prioritizing fruits and vegetables before kind of grains like rice and, and um, bread. I know we love our rice and bread, but um, prioritizing certain things before we prioritize rice and bread and treats is kind of the way to go if you want to get the most um, most out of your meal when you're breaking your fast and also at Sahari time. 
Um, two recommendations that are not food related. Um, number one, take naps if you can. Again, sleep deprivation is a really big component of Ramadan. So taking naps can really help you get through your fast and just kind of reduce um, the negative effects of the sleep deprivation. Ask if you can shift your work schedule, if you have a understand, understanding supervisor who might be able to allow you to start a little bit later and end later. And then the, the last recommendation I have um, is to dress for heat. So a natural byproduct of eating food is heat in our body. So when we're, so that's why, I don't know if any of you noticed, but you generally will be a little bit more colder um, when you're fasting. And that's because we're, we're just not eating. Uh, our bodies are really like furnaces. If, if you don't put any wood in the fire to keep it going, it's gonna, um, it's not gonna, you know, the fire is gonna go out. So it's very similar to how the body works is food is what's converted into energy, but a byproduct of that energy production is heat. So that's why when we're fasting, we generally feel a little bit colder. Um, so dress for heat to, you know, support your body so that it doesn't have to focus as much um, energy and resources on keeping you warm when you can kind of do that for it by dressing a little bit warmer. And this again, um, is an issue that is even more exacerbated for people who have PCOS or hypothyroidism. I won't touch on exercise. Um, okay, so I wanna talk through kind of like building a healthier iftar or sahay. So number one, we wanna pick our protein first. Um, so that's gonna be, um, for sahari, it can be Greek yogurt, milk, cheese, eggs. Um, and then for iftar, you know, chicken, lamb, beef, whatever meat choices we have, yogurt as well. Um, basically any sort of uh, fish, seafood, um, we're gonna pick our protein first. And then we're gonna choose nutrient dense carbs or nu more nutrient dense carbs versus less nutrient dense carbs. So that's gonna be our vegetables for iftar. And then for uh, sahari vegetables and fruit. So for example, if you're making an omelet for sahari time, you could put your um, vegetables in the omelet. So it kind of, you kind of hit two birds with one stone. Um, and then um, that's not to say that you can't have rice or bread, but I'm, but I'm really speaking in the context of like a limited capacity to eat one, because when we're fasting, our stomach uh, also shrinks. So we physically have less space, but also we only have two opportunities to really have a good solid meal um, and we're limited in our time. These rules really don't apply when we're you know, not on a fasting schedule, I think there's a lot more flexibility to have uh, not as rigid rules around eating. Um, and I really don't like to promote rigid food rules. But again, you know, we're trying to get the most bang for our buck when it comes to the two times that we're going to eat during Ramadan. So, um, so yeah, so pick your protein first, then choose your nutrient dense carbs, it's going to be fruits and vegetables. Um, and then, um, and then you can uh, put your treats, rice, bread, and treats um, on your plate as well. For Sahri, I do encourage you to include a smoothie as a daily part of uh, you know, every day because it's a really great way to get a lot more nutrients in without having to eat a lot more food. So um, a smoothie can look as simple as a cup of milk, your fruit of choice. Um, you could add in some collagen for added protein. Um, a little bit of honey and then mix it all up. And, and you, and that's a really solid way to get in more calcium, mag, magnesium, protein, um, zinc, copper, a lot of nutrients that you would really have to work hard to eat from whole solid foods. So for um, iftar, for breaking fast, I talked about this already, but you really want to, you want to break your fast with a date and water, and then you want to prioritize something that's water um, rich. So fruit salad is a really good option. Um, and then I do have a hydrating drink. I can send the link for that if anybody's interested. It's basically a mixture of water, coconut water, a little bit of salt um, and lemon, um, which provides some vitamin C. It's a great way to get your electrolytes. Um, and you guys can um, sip on it throughout the night. Um, again, with building a if healthier iftar, you wanna center your protein, your vegetables, then your grains, and then your treats. Um, one thing to keep in mind um, is I know that, again, I'm, 
I'm Pakistani, so I'm coming a lot from a Pakistani background. And we have some things like jar, which is like basically a chickpea, tomato, potato mixture. Um, but I know that um, in Iranian culture, there's a lot of lentils and beans in many of the dishes that you all make. So um, I just want to remind, like, I just want to make a point about that is that uh, lentils, beans, chickpeas um, are very hard to digest. So when we're in a situation where we're fasting and we're kind of trying to get the, extract the most amount of nutrition out of the foods we consume, I would encourage you to minimize the amount of kind of like beans and lentils and chickpeas that we're consuming during this month because, um, because they are hard to digest and it does take a lot more effort for the body to extract nutrients from these foods. And so if we're trying to kind of like make sure we're getting enough nutrition um, during this month, those, I would save those foods for times when you're not kind of like competing against the clock. <clears throat> Yeah, so those are all my tips. Um, thanks for listening. Great, thank you so much. That was incredibly helpful. I learned so many things that I didn't even know why, like I didn't know why I get cold every day, but now I know. So thank you so much, that was incredibly helpful. Just keep in mind everybody, you're welcome to put your questions in the chat, um, but now we're gonna switch over to Reza for his presentation. All right, <clears throat> like going. Um, bear with me if I'm seeming a little tired. I've had my coffee today, obviously, so kind of getting to me. Um, all right, so the question um, that was presented to me was how to maintain muscle mass uh, during Ramadan. Um, I had a little presentation. It's more for me than you guys, so I can keep my thoughts on track. Um, so looking at like the research on uh, maintaining muscle mass during Ramadan specifically, uh, the research out there isn't very good, um, to be mm -hmm. honest. So um, as uh, Sister Noshin was talking about, uh, Ramadan fasting is very different than some of the other fasting, right? So all the research done on uh, sports performance or just uh, training in general during Ramadan is very like varied. Um, the conditions that surround Ramadan make it hard to, to kind of do research on this stuff. For example, like are you doing research during the shorter months of Ramadan when it's like, like in the wintertime when you don't have to pass as long or longer season? Uh, male versus female studies is sleep being controlled well on subjects. And um, during uh, most of the research done on training uh, during Ramadan is done in the Middle East, and they're not very good at keeping track of like the population groups, like whether these are like professional athletes or obese individuals. So um, those factors kind of play into the research, which makes it hard to kind of determine um, what exactly happens uh, to your body during Ramadan specifically um, when you're trying to train. Uh, what does the research show us uh, that I've seen from what I've looked at is that um, specifically during uh, Ramadan fasting, strength does decrease, um, which obviously makes sense because muscles are made up of like 75% water, so you're dehydrated, um, you're not getting as much protein in, so all these things um, play factors into like how well your muscles are contracting while you're working out. Um, and then uh, there aren't a lot of studies that show uh, what the results are. Like if you continue training during Ramadan, like post Ramadan, when you are going back to your normal routine, how does that like performance spike? Um, I've seen a couple research articles on this. Uh, one that was pretty interesting was done on soccer players. Um, during Ramadan, they were looking at how well uh, the, their performance was post-Ramadan after they did um, training during uh, fasting. And they had two different groups. One, they had kind of like a tapered uh, strength training um, routine going on with them. And then the other one was uh, just kind of like their regular routine. The tapered, like kind of tapering off the strength training uh, showed really good results and significant improvements in strength and power for the soccer players. Um, I also came across another study a while back uh, where they just took like regular individuals and they did studies on um, like muscle contraction and during, uh, they had them do like a, a strength and conditioning program during Ramadan while fasting and post Ramadan, they were significantly stronger. Um, and then my personal experience working with professional athletes, I've worked with a lot of Muslim professional athletes 
um, who played professional basketball, uh, UFC fighters, boxers, and every single one that I talked to, I've asked them, like, how do they feel while training uh, and competing during Ramadan? And all of them said they feel better. Like, they feel like their performance is enhanced. The research may not, like, reflect that, but that's just what they've they've described. And um, a lot of them have shown, like, a lot of success while competing during Ramadan, where some of their stats are even increased. Uh, all the non-athletes that I've worked with who aren't professional athletes, but they continue training during Ramadan and work out, um, we always see a significant strength increase post-Ramadan. So you might not see it during Ramadan, but... Once they come back and we get back into our regular routine and we test their strength, they're significantly stronger coming back. Um, and I think it's something we said about working out and fasting um, in general, just in terms of like the mental toughness that's required, um, being able to stick with a routine during that like uncomfortable month. Um, and I think it helps set the tone for the rest of the year as well. And then uh, some of the things that I I suggest doing to maintain um, muscle strength uh, during Ramadan is one, uh, don't be sedentary, continue moving, um, even just a little bit constantly, like try to work out. Um, I always use a suggestion to Muslim clients or just Muslim friends in general. I always tell them to use a lot as a uh, uh, way to uh, utilize for a workout schedule. So you have to pray five times a day anyway. Um, might as well, like, as soon as you're done with your prayer, just bang out a couple push-ups, a couple mountain climbers right afterwards. I think it's really interesting that out of all the other religions, we have to move during our salat. And uh, that's very unique compared to, like, other, all the other um, faiths. Uh, let's see. And make sure you get enough sleep. Um, sleep has a big impact on muscle growth. And uh, just like Sister Nasheen said, eat healthy, stay away from junk food. And then when you are doing strength training, focus on eccentric movements. So there's three different ways that your muscles contract. There's concentric, where the muscle shortens as it, as it uh, tightens. There's uh, um, isometric, where the muscle doesn't change uh, length at all. So like this would be a concentric motion where the bicep is getting smaller. This is isometric where it's not changing. And then eccentric would be as it's extending out. So Usually eccentric exercises are you're going against the resistance. So if you're bench pressing, it's like on the way down. Um, same with squat on the way down. So as the muscles lengthening, uh, if you're focusing a lot on eccentric movements during um, your workout routine, that promotes uh, muscle growth and muscle strength uh, more so than the other contractions. Um, and all the research shows that you should hold that eccentric contraction for about five seconds to optimize um, muscle growth. But, yeah, that's about it. Thank you so much, Rosa. That was really amazing. Um, so we do have some questions um, that I'm going to go ahead and start reading off. Um, so Jalil asks, how many grams of protein do you need per body weight to maintain muscle mass? I imagine that question is for both of you. <laughs> I'm curious to see what brother is going to say. I'll let, I'll let you answer that. It's just your realm. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, my understanding of like uh, protein is that you can only, your body can only absorb um, a certain amount in an hour. Uh, so it was, it, I would assume it's hard to, to take in high amounts of protein um, during the night. So I'm sure Sister Machine has more tips on like how you can do that. Yeah, so um, one thing about maintaining muscle mass while fasting is research does show that that's actually one thing that does go down with fasting. Um, so I think it's hard to kind of prevent, a, it's probably, you could probably prevent a significant amount of muscle mass loss, but there is going to be some just by the very nature of, of what we're doing. Um, but I generally recommend about 35 to 40 grams of protein per meal, which can seem a lot um, for people who don't know how to prioritize protein in their meals. Um, so what that looks like, uh, for example, for Sahari, it could be, um, I think, uh, about... So it's definitely, uh, I recommend two eggs every day for everybody because of the choline. Choline is really, really important for liver function. And so if you're, and 
eggs are really kind of the best way to get it unless everybody wants to start eating liver, which I know nobody likes. So, um, so I know nobody's going to do that. So definitely, um, and two eggs is really not enough to meet your daily choline need, but it's really does help you meet at least like 80% of it. So if you were to do uh, a plan of meal, like two large eggs, um, one cup smoothie, which would include like collagen and a cup of milk. Um, if you wanted to add Greek yogurt, that would put it at about, um, 40, 40 grams of protein. So I would recommend, um, 35 to 40 grams of protein per meal. Um, and in general, you really, uh, for women, I recommend getting at least 80 grams a day, um, in general. So with Ramadan, it's, you know, it's going to be hard to hit that. Um, unless you're like basically eating all night, <laughs> which is not very comfortable. Um, so I think if you hit about 35 to 40, you can actually hit it if you add the two eating episodes, but that's, that's my recommendation. Amazing. Um, so the next question is, do you have any recommendations on how to curb cravings for carbs? Yeah. Um, is that while fasting or in general? Yeah, while fasting and then during, like, this was my question. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> like, um, I understand it's important to look for nutrient-dense carbs, but I feel like towards the end of the day when you're so hungry, you just want, like, a really good piece of bread <laughs> to yeah, eat. I mean, or right. Honestly, it's really hard for me to give very like rigid recommendations because that's just not my approach to nutrition um in general like outside of the context of Ramadan but you're likely craving carbs because that's what the body craves when one it's hungry right so it's not necessarily that like oh you have some sort of issue where like specifically like your body wants carbs for some reason like maybe you have insulin resistance or something it's just because carbs are the preferred source of energy for our body um just by the very nature of being hungry for 14 hours, that might be the first thing that it does as it craves carbs. So you might find that once you've broken your fast, your desire for, for uh, something sweet might've gone away. Um, so it could just be, a, you know, your body saying, Hey, I'm hungry. Um, but even after you've broken your fast, you've had a meal and you feel like, Oh, I need something sweet that could indicate other things like, you know, it could be an indication of, um, insulin resistance. It could mean you're not getting enough minerals. Maybe you didn't eat enough carbs for that meal. There's just so many different like reasons why it could be. But if we're talking about the context of fasting and Ramadan specifically, I really think it's just your body saying, Hey, I'm hungry. And the first signal that it knows how to send to us is for craving carbs. Um, and that's just because, you know, carbs is our preferred source of energy. That totally makes sense. Can you comment on that? I totally feel that because I also like I feel like everybody craves carbs carbs above like everything else when you're hungry and I try to when I break my fast like eat things that aren't carbs first because your stomach does get a lot smaller and then by the time I'm like a quarter through the plate of like protein and like fruit that I'm trying to eat I'm like I still want like a piece of butt but there's no space for it anymore <laughs> yeah yeah. And then in a non-fasting world, right, we would be able to kind of accommodate for all of the choices that we want to make around food. Mm. Awesome. Um, the next question is, what's the eccentric, eccentric aspect of a bicep curl and how do you emphasize it? Rosa, I think you're muted. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so the eccentric, like I was saying, is when the muscle's lengthening. So on a bicep curl, if you're holding the dumbbells or whatever weight or bands, it's on the way down. So the way you could like emphasize that is take a, a very heavy band that you typically would not be able to lift up on your own um, with, with, uh, but with one arm and you lift up with two hands, right? And then slowly fight against the resistance, resistance coming down. Then you use your other hand or if you have a spotter or you're working out with somebody, have them help you lift it up and then slowly go against the resistance and bring it back down. Um, like I was saying, the eccentric contraction is uh, shown to Im improve um, uh, muscle size and, and strength um, more so than the other three, the other two contractions. Cool. 
Thank you. Um, so we have multiple questions about like good sources of vegetarian protein. You mentioned that beans, lentils are, are difficult to digest. So other than eggs, is there anything that we can eat that might be a good source of protein? Yeah, I think just eggs and dairy are going to be your biggest um, sources for bioavailable protein. And then of course, like if you, if you are on a vegetarian diet, you really can't, you, you know, you have to rely on some, to some capacity, rely on lentils and beans and, and chickpeas. But if you are doing that, I would highly recommend that you soak and sprout your lentils and beans, um, because that makes them much more digestible um, than just kind of taking them out of the bag and putting them in a pressure cooker. Got it. Could you elaborate on like the types of dairy? Like, can we eat pizza? You know, <laughs> <laughs> cheese and yogurt. Greek yogurt has more protein than regular yogurt. Um, so opting for that can be helpful. Um, I don't really know any other kinds of dairy. Any kind of cheese, honestly, works. Um, but if you do a combination of that and with eggs, you, you could um, get about, and then also there's nuts and seeds, but again, that, again, that bioavailability and digestibility piece is still a problem. So soaking your, um, soaking your nuts and seeds as well is helpful for increasing their digestibility. Awesome. Um, what does a 35 to 40 gram of protein look like for a chicken breast? Yeah. So, um, about three ounces of chicken breast, which is like the size of your palm is 25 uh, grams of protein. So four ounces is about 35. So I think just slightly bigger than the size of your palm would give you about 35 grams. Awesome. Thank you. So uh, the next question is from Marzia. She's asking, how do you recommend we adjust workouts during Ramadan? Should we decrease the number of days per week or focus on strength versus cardio or so on? Um, honestly, it depends on what you're trying to do uh, and like what you can handle. My recommendation is like three times a week um, and just do slow like weightlifting just to maintain that muscle strength. And like I said, just keep moving. Um, like I don't like overdo it myself or, or like with clients um, during Ramadan. Uh, I think doing like a moderate cardio exercise um, while fasting is a good way to kind of like, you know, drop pounds lose some weight um and usually when it comes to cardio i'll have like people do like the treadmill with the incline all the way up just walking um just get their heart rate up but not like over exertion um where it's like sprints and stuff like that i just try to keep it like very simple um but yeah i would just do like three days a week if you're just trying to stay in shape and not go overboard unless you're like competing athlete then that would change um, just to follow up on that, is there a particular time of day that works best? Like, should we be working out after we break our fast, before, in the morning, during, after suhoor, before suhoor? So there's two, I got two answers for that one. Um, I think uh, like right before FDAR is a good time. Um, just cause like, then you can just replenish everything right afterwards, uh, ideally. Like if you have that type of schedule, um, that's good to do. Uh, some of the other research that I was looking at in terms of like um, when it comes to like sports performance and stuff, uh, when it comes to fasting uh, and working out, um, they would see these huge uh, increases, like I said, in, in, um, in strength and power uh, post-Ramadan. And um, some of the theories behind that was that um, while you're fasting, your body is basically being starved, right? So you kind of think of it as a, a bell-shaped like graph where um, we get to a certain point during the day and then because our bodies are like thinking, okay, we're starving, we need to find food, they start working at like an optimum level, right? So that's why you can kind of like smell things from far away and uh, you kind of feel like you're in the zone, right? And then right afterwards, it just crashes, right? And you just like feel like you're, you know, underwater. Um, if you kind of like hit that, that optimum point of the day when you're, uh, you know, feeling like at your best, you, you can kind of think of it as like, that's when your muscles are going to be contracting the best. That's the when your body's going to be processing everything really well. Um, so you might get really strong gains during your workout um, during that time. 
Um, so I think it just depends on the person and their body too um, and what they're trying to accomplish. But those are like two ways of looking at it. Amazing, thank you. I have someone who messaged me with a question asking if there are any particular suhoor foods that help conserve energy throughout the day. Um, I don't think there's any one particular food, um, but really you wanna just prioritize the things I've talked about, the protein, the fruits and vegetables, um, the smoothie, um, replenish your liver sugar store so you can balance your blood sugar for at least up to six hours after um, after you eat. Um, but we are fasting for a really long time. So I don't think there's too much more than that that we can do to, um, you know, nothing's going to make us like not hungry at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Amazing. Um, are there any other questions before we close out the event? I have a question. Yeah. It's less, I mean, I don't know how where water falls on nutrition, but how much water do you actually need? Because I barely drink water on a regular day. And then in Ramadan, it is so hard for me to get in the amount that you're supposed to have between Iftar and Sahur, especially because I don't wake up for Sahur anyway. So I do end up chugging and then like, it's just, you would just end up getting up to pee a lot. It's just like, I'm like, this is not working. I feel okay. Like I feel dehydrated, but also like, I know drinking a lot of water is supposed to be really good for you, but like, how much do you really need? Yeah, that's a, that's one of my favorite questions because um, the eight glasses a day is actually, there's really no evidence for it. Um, so what, when it comes to my clients, I always say drink to thirst. I have a lot of clients who come to me and they're carrying these like ginormous bottles around. Um, and there is such a thing as drinking too much water. So you really just want to base it off of thirst. Oftentimes when you drink too much water, it can actually make you more thirsty because again, you're not replenishing electrolytes, you're re replenishing fluid, which is going to throw off a lot of things in your, in your system. So even if you're drinking enough water, you might actually still feel very thirsty. So I just say drink to thirst. Of course, you want to also be mindful of, um, I know some people just like don't have like thirst radar whatsoever. And they're like, literally could be dehydrated all day long. And they just like, don't even realize it. So it's also important to keep in mind, um, just like keep an eye on your like urine color. If it's too dark, you are likely dehydrated. And you know, most of us will be dehydrated to some extent while we're fasting. Um, but you, I, I don't think that you need to like feel pressured to drink like 64 ounces of fluid before the night's over. I feel better about that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Brother Diego, uh, do you have a question? Yes, so I'm going to come up with Chandler Conti. Um, so I'm gonna, I just, uh, this week I just began uh, my uh, workout for 90 day transformation. Um, I, I wanted to ask, what is the key in um, like just burning fat? Um, because like I'm, I'm working on uh, doing things in moderation and, and being consistent, but I, I'm just having struggles with like, getting myself to my ideal body image. So is there any recommendations for, um, for exercising? Um. Uh, yeah, so um, in terms of burning fat, like I was saying during Ramadan, you're gonna burn a lot of fat um, because your uh, glycogen stores in your muscles are depleted, right? So now your body's are looking for other sources of energy to fuel the workout. And so it'll tend to, in some cases, burn fat, right? Um, uh, as far as going for like the ideal body type, I mean, I that's all like you know dependent on like what you're looking to do and in, in terms of your workout, um, and you know depending on what look you're going for, then you would model the workout in terms of that, whether it's looks or performance or um, whatever. So it really is dependent on what your goals are. So. Well, the fact that we're not drinking as much water assists with burning fat, because when I when I was exercising outside of Ramadan, I felt like I lost more weight because I was drinking more water. Um, I'll let Sister Nishina. I was really hoping you would take that one because I'm not really sure, but um, 
I don't think that if you were drinking more water, I, I'm not really sure actually. Um, but just remember that some, some weight that we lose is water weight. So well, take that into so account. In terms of like, in terms of working out, like, I don't, I don't believe drinking more water is going to burn more fat. Um, it's going to keep you hydrated, which is going to be safe. Um, you got to remember, like, especially when we're working with fighters, for example, I'll just use that as an example, because they go through these extreme um, phases of dehydration to cut weight, and it becomes very dangerous if they're not doing it correctly, because your brain is encased in fluid, right? So a lot of these guys that you see dying in the boxing ring is due to them being dehydrated and taking blows to the head or, or doing some type of like high impact, um, you know, uh, training, even if during sparring or whatever. So um, I don't think uh, staying hydrated uh, is going, like drinking more water is going to burn fat, but it is going to be safe. And like Sister Nasheen was saying, is, you know, you feel thirsty, drink more. Um, I think you're better off doing that. But doing like high intensity um, workouts and, um, you know, burning calories, that's, those are things that are going to help burn, burn off that weight. Thank you. That answers my question. Is that correct? Thank you so much. Uh, any other questions before we wrap up? I'm going to take that as a no really quickly. Um, first off, I want to thank our speakers for joining us this evening. I know you both have very busy schedules and it's Ramadan and you need to get home and eat and cook and all of these things. So we really appreciate your time. Um, I'd like to remind everybody that tomorrow we have an in-person event. Uh, titled Fasting in Jewish and Islamic Tradition. This is an interfaith event, and we really, um, Hedia, what is this face? Is that not the event? It's on Thursday. Today is Tuesday. It's on Thursday. I I'm sorry, guys. I, like, I'm I fasting, and I studied all day, and it's not, it ain't here right now, okay? So the event is on Thursday at 7 p.m. It's called Fasting in Jewish and Islamic Tradition. Don't show up at the masjid tomorrow. It's on Thursday, um, but we'll also have an online component as well, um, so you can join us there. Thank you for being here, Hedia, because that would not have been good. <laughs> Come through. It's going to be such a good event. Um, Lee Weissman is going to be leading it to tell us about Jewish fasting traditions. And he's, I don't know if anybody else here follows him on Instagram or Twitter, but he's very cool. I love him. He's like at Jihadi Jew on Instagram. Um, <laughs> and there's going to be a star at IEC. So come through. Amazing. All right. Thank you, everyone, so much. Have a good evening. Ramadan Mubarak. Thank you. Thank you.